the spiritual landscape in, from a Scandinavian perspective. And I was thinking if anybody would come <laughs> and listen to this, uh, uh, it's not going to be too detailed, but uh, I want to give some examples from Scandinavia uh, about the changes that are going on in Europe, but also, I believe, uh, all over the world. Uh, sooner in some places, later in other places. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what it's all about uh, this afternoon. <coughs> and I'm, I'm aware of that when I use some, maybe some theological terms, uh, they might be a little different. Uh, for example, Europeans use the term evangelical a little bit different than what Americans do uh, when it comes to Protestants grou uh, Protestant groups, but I think you'll get the, uh, the drift of it. Now, I will, uh, uh, because my wife and I came into the church about a year ago, uh, so I will use uh, some of my experience from, of course, the, the Protestant world. Uh, but I, I want you not to you know, get hung up over the details, but see that there is something that is um, uh, a perspective that, that I think um, in one way the Lord wants to give us of what is changing in many nations right now when it comes to Christians that are actually finding one another and why they're doing it and, and how this can be developed. Scandinavia, and more particularly Sweden, has been considered one of the most secular nations in the world, maybe the most secular nation in the world. And uh, since the Protestant Reformation that uh, uh, was um, in the 1500s, it's been, it's been a very strongly un unified Lutheran na country. Uh, it has, been a, has a Lutheran state church that has dominated the scene in an overwhelming way all the way up to the 19th century. Uh, the revival movements uh, that later became uh, free churches, they broke that monopoly in the 1800s or in the 19th century. Uh, they, they and together with the increase in secularization and also a strong socialist labor movement in Sweden uh, has changed the religious scene drastically. The revival movements uh, that were uh, quite big and substantial in the 1800s turned into free churches, and they contended with the Lutheran state church, uh, which uh, step by step led to more plurality and um, eventually to change legislation in Sweden. Uh, this gave uh, Swedish citizens more religious freedom, uh, not automatically being registered in the Lutheran church, which they were up to only a few decades ago, uh, as being Lutheran by birth. <laughs> so uh, you're not like that anymore. These changes came very late in Sweden. Uh, 1951 came a more, much more flexible uh, law of religious freedom. Uh, but for example, not uh, until in 1970, were Catholic uh, monasteries allowed, or any form of monastery allowed to be started in Sweden. So you can see it's an entirely different scene from what you have here in the United States. Now Catholics were not allowed to express their faith after the Reformation, and conversion to the Catholic faith after the Reformation uh, resulted uh, mostly in death penalty. Uh, as late as in the middle of the 1800s, conversion to Catholicism meant um, expulsion from the nation. Uh, and uh, this means that uh, it was fostered in many, uh, during these 500 years a very anti-Catholic sentiment. Uh, Catholics were not, were not on the map, not on the horizon anymore. Uh, we had hardly anybody of them in Sweden. Uh, <coughs> Uh, from the Lutheran State Church, there has been a staunch resistance against Catholics, but also against um, the free churches. For, and these, of course, for different uh, theological reasons. Secularization, step by step, changed this in Sweden. Uh, the free church movement, particularly in Sweden, has been very strong and influential. Uh, I would say probably the strongest in, in, in uh, Europe, except for m uh, maybe in England. And, uh, but due to this strong uh, secularization, uh, its influence also waned step by step. Uh, and among the free churches, it was particularly the uh, Pentecostals that has been growing and had an influence uh, far stronger in Scandinavia and out from Scandinavia also uh, than in many other places in Europe. The 1970s brought in the charismatic movement. And the charismatic movement greatly affected all the different churches in Sweden and Scandinavia. 
resistance against the charismatic movement came primarily from theologically liberal groups, but also as well from theologically very conservative Lutherans and from some traditional Pentecostal groups. Maybe, you know, this is uh, uh, something that happens that uh, uh, the latest revival will always uh, attack what comes up next. Anyway, what happened was that um, uh, sometimes to the big surprise of many Pentecostals, this charismatic movement uh, went into all, basically all the different denominations in Sweden and in many ways broke down uh, this uh, compartmental attitude and this outright hostility that existed between different Christian groups. In this environment, there was an awareness of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church in Sweden uh, is a small church. Sweden has uh, nine million people, so it's not a big nation. Uh, 2.8% goes regularly to church, which is not very much. If you go to some um, uh, evangelical seminaries, they would have a quota at four, you know, if somebody comes from a nation that is under 4%, they are eligible to a missionary scholarship. <laughs> so uh, anybody in Sweden would have that because we only have 2.8% people going to church in, in totality. And that's divided with, between the Lutheran state church or now former state church because after 2000, it's not a state church anymore and the different free churches. And a third group that has come into Sweden, which are the immigrant groups. Now, the Catholic Church is mainly immigrants and has been looked upon as an Im immigrant church. Now, an immigrant church basically means that there are immigrants coming, bringing their religion with them, and uh, facilitated by, by, by the nation uh, so that they can um, live out their religious faith. But they are looked upon as something that comes from the outside and doesn't necessarily influence uh, the nation uh, in any way. Uh, but step by step, uh, the Catholic Church has started to grow and attitudes towards it, which were quite hostile, uh, especially at the beginning of the 20th century and on, uh, has, has changed a lot. At the millennium, there was a shift uh, and the Lutheran State Church became free from the church. Uh, it has over the years been accused of being overly political because of the connection with the state. Bishop was appointed by the state. Local church authority was el politically elected uh, along po political party lines, etc., and actually still is. Uh, this new freedom for, former, uh, for the former state church uh, did not diminish the political influence. And uh, one example of this is how the Lutheran Church in Sweden recently, not many years ago, uh, followed state legisl legislation uh, when it comes to um, gender neutral, neutral marriages and uh, decided uh, not just to bless these marriages but to officially perform same-sex couple marriages and referring uh, not just to different theological reasons, there were also theological reasons for this, but also so, uh, in fact, uh, referring to that if the state has made this a law, which the state made a law the 1st of May 2009, then also it is the duty of the church to implement the law and to perform the right, which they started to do from 1st of November 2009. So this is a highly politicized and secularized uh, uh, church that used to be state church. Uh, state church means it was uh, sponsored by the state. It means that it has a, uh, quite a, a dominance culturally also over the nation. But in this very secularized environment, Christians from many different traditions also being alarmed about this uh, rapid secularization uh, started to find one another uh, and to start a fellowship in actually in an unprecedented way, a way that's never happened before uh, in Sweden. Uh, the need for unity, and there are many reasons for it and I'll not go into them, uh, became much more obvious before uh, than before. And the old reasons for uh, avoiding one another seem no more adequate. It looked like the divisions in uh, among the Christians in Sweden were not going along denominational lines, but they were going along uh, altogether uh, uh, other issues. Of course, uh, the issue of abortion or the issue of homosexuality and so on, uh, or, or uh, uh, gender neutral marriages were, uh, were coming to the focus. Now, this outward pressure uh, has forced many Christians in Sweden to start to focus on more essential and important questions than 
basically what we have together. What is it that is common ground? Uh, not what is it that divide us. Uh, the need for true unity, uh, the need for stability, the need for clear doctrine, the need for historical roots and for the authenticity in spiritual matters has strongly come to the surface uh, the last decade in Sweden uh, in, an, in a very unusual way. The interest in historical Christianity and uh, particularly in the Catholic Church uh, has emerged in, emerged in a very unique way in these new circumstances. These circumstances have fostered, fostered an entirely different climate and a longing for unity for re-evangelization has touched Christians in almost every circle and has created a number of new initiatives. Uh, one of those initiatives that's been quite unique uh, is something called the Jesus Manifestation. Now, when it comes to numbers, uh, you're living in the United States, of course, uh, just by the very fact that you are much more people here, uh, your numbers are bigger. But in Sweden, to uh, gather 10 to up to 18,000 uh, Christians from almost every denomination uh, is quite impressive, actually. Uh, and this is what this Jesus manifestation was. Uh, once a year in our capital, Stockholm, uh, Christians from Pentecostals, Neo-Charismatics, and all the way down to the Catholic Church with the Catholic Bishop of Sweden uh, re speaking on the same platform and everybody kneeling together uh, for prayer that Jesus Christ again will be Lord over our nation and that he will change both individuals and the nation. This is something that has never happened before. And I would say like 10 years before that, 15 years before that, or maybe 20, nobody would ever thought that it could happen, but it did happen. Uh, and uh, it's been a very very, very special, a very graced event. This initiative is a result of a longer process. Uh, there are a number of factors that contributed to this change, and I'll, I'll mention uh, about 10 of them quickly. There have been, of course, some form of formal, formal evangelical, uh, um, ecumenical, I would say, ecumenical dialogue going on in Sweden. Uh, those formal dialogues sometimes are between leaders, uh, and they, it's good that they meet, it's good that they discuss, but usually it doesn't penetrate or filter down to the grassroots, but it lives its life of its own. Uh, but the one between the, the Catholics and the Pentecostals has been very successful, and it's been uh, something that has actually surprised everybody. But even more important, uh, are probably more informal initiatives that has emerged over these last, uh, I would say, 10, 15 years. Uh, if, you, if we go back to the 90s, there was uh, an initiative called Yes to Life, which of course you have here in the United States. Uh, it, it is marches, pro-life marches. Uh, Sweden, uh, with the legislation and with the culture, is uh, uh, very much pro-abortion. Uh, it, it is Sweden is a strange nation. It's a good nation, and I love it. Uh, but is uh, and I use it as an example uh, uh, for any nation as such. But there is a, a, a conservative element and almost a puritanical uh, element as much as a very uh, radical element. Uh, and the radical element is that, uh, in one way, both, uh, both uh, the Swedish government and also primarily the Swedish state church has always wanted to be avant-garde, always wanted to push certain agendas, always wanted to go before, uh, and in one way, I would say out of pride, saying we do this and then the rest of the world will understand. Now this has to do with a number of things, but one of the things is of course uh, abortion, promoting abortion. Now, in this environment, uh, it emerged uh, from m many different free churches and uh, also the Catholic Church, of course, uh, and also somewhat a little bit from the state church, uh, something called Yes to Life, which was a march going on uh, every year. And there were up to five, seven, ten thousand people. And it actually shocked the nation, it shocked the media. They tried to ignore it, but they couldn't. And it was something that they thought they had overcome uh, and uh, that this issue was dead. Nobody would talk about it uh, again. And, and s the, the Christians came out, uh, and uh, not in a hateful way, but in a loving way, singing, praising the Lord, but speaking very clear about right to life, that life starts at conception, uh, and uh, we have a right both of the beginning and the end uh, of our life, uh, and so forth. So this was something that, that was a surprise. Uh, 
the third thing I would mention is the Catholic Bishop of Sweden. Now, Sweden being a, a, a reform uh, Lutheran nation, uh, hardly any Catholics for hundreds of years, then step by step a few Catholics would come in uh, and eventually uh, Sweden would get a Catholic bishop and it was usually a German. Uh, but 1999, the first Swedish Catholic bishop since the Reformation uh, was installed in Stockholm. And uh, this is a Carmelite monk, uh, priest, and his name is Anders Aborelius. And this co also caught the media by surprise. Uh, and uh, they started to be interested in him. And he has managed, by the grace of God, uh, to uh, have a communication with um, believers in the land doesn't matter what background you have. And he has been a rallying point. And in him here we see that the uh, uh, Catholic Church has moved into the center in a way that nobody thought would happen in Sweden. Still a, a, a small church. is only 140,000 uh, Catholics in Sweden, registered Catholics. There are more non-registered, but still it, it is a small church. But now they see this is not just an immigration church. Uh, nothing wrong in that in a sense, but this is also more and more Swedes are coming to the faith, and uh, this is something that, that the media uh, is look, looks upon. With, with pu they're puzzled because it does not fit the secularization uh, plan, of course. Uh, the fourth thing is something called the Oasis Movement. The Oasis Movement uh, is a strong movement in Poland. It's a Polish uh, Catholic charismatic movement. I in Sweden, it became a Lutheran charismatic movement, uh, but uh, quite substantial, and many Lutherans have joined it. It started in 1983, and it's been a rallying point within the Lutheran Church uh, against uh, this strong liberalization in the state church. And it's been very open to free church people. A lot of free church people have come in, and they have frequently Catholic speakers in their conferences. Uh, Father Raniero Cantalamesa has been there a number of times this summer as well. Bishop Anders Aborelius has been there also. So this is also something uh, um, uh, that is new in Sweden. And what I'm, why I'm saying these things, of course, you don't know the details about this, and, but you can see a, a picture here. This is more of a prophetic picture, that the Lord in darkness, where there is chaos, where there is secularization, and people ba basically laughing at Christianity. I mean, of course, that hasn't happened yet in the U.S., but uh, you're on the same slippery slope. Uh, and in this, God always has surprises. So I guess the basic message in this is to say, you know, keep your hope up. Uh, know that Jesus Christ is Lord. He has all power uh, in heaven and also in the U.S. and in Sweden and or wherever you live. Uh, and he is always ready to answer the prayers of the believers, the faithful. He, he hears the cry, he says, of the faithful, and he will answer. And when we pray for our nation, it uh, doesn't matter if we are few or many, uh, we are, per definition, and we heard that this conference, per definition, we are always more, because with Jesus Christ, we are always more. So we have all the reason in the world, even though we see a lot of darkness around us, to be encouraged and to expect that the Lord will grace our nation or our city or our uh, local church uh, with his presence. Do you believe that? Yeah. I didn't hear you. Yeah. Amen. Back to my manuscript. <laughs> So uh, another thing that happened in, in this, um, uh, in this uh, development was informal prayer that started between different uh, leaders in different denominations. Even bishops joined. And this uh, was prayer groups where they were not uh, allowed to talk about what was going on. They were not going to put it into their newsletter. They were not going to use it for their own denominational or ministerial purposes. It was just prayer, like an upper room experience, waiting on the Lord, praying. And uh, this has gone on for a number of years, and uh, it has uh, affected those leaders that has been involved. Some of them came into the same room without knowing that the other guy would come into the room, and they haven't shook hands for years. Uh, and now, of course, uh, they had to, but more than shake hands, they had to pray for one another. People that pray for one another have a hard time hating one another. Can you say amen to that? Well, this is so. So, informal prayer, meeting with leaders from different denominations and movements, 
has fostered relations of love and respect, and which is the start of unity. Another Carmelite, a Carmelite priest and monk, his name is Wilfred Stinnison, he is now with the Lord. Uh, he authored a number of books on spiritual life and different issues uh, that has been very attractive to uh, especially free church people, and he's a Catholic, uh, and uh, I've met people that have read him. He, he's so iconized uh, that his name is Stinnison. They always say, do you have a book of Stinnison? Of course. Uh, and uh, so they read it, and once I said, do you like the book? Yeah, I like this. It's a wonderful uh, uh, book, on, on, on a devotional book. And I told this person, do you know that, that he's a Catholic? No, he's not a Catholic, is it? <laughs> go back and says that he is but you know so sometimes the Lord has to do this to slip in the message or just help people to overcome prejudices prejudices on both sides so that we at least can look at one another in a time of need we will be pushed together in a time of need we are not that many in a time of need we must uh, wash each other's uh, feet in a time of need we must look up to Jesus together and uh, it doesn't mean we want to do it. Uh, if we are in a majority position, if we are, uh, if we feel a, a, a human strength, a financial strength, a cultural strength, or whatever, we don't care too much about the others. But when we don't have that anymore, because it's been stripped away from us, from the state, or from secularization, or from uh, different things going on, then our hearts open up, and we start to understand more in depth that we truly need one another. Can you say amen to that? Now let me give another example, a Pentecostal minister in Sweden, his name is Peter Heldorf. He is the most, probably the most unusual Pentecostal in the world. He has a great interest in the Eastern churches. He loves the Orthodox Church. He is very fascinated by the Coptic Church and the Desert Fathers. He walks around in, in, in uh, what would looks like a habit with the Eastern uh, right. Uh, and he has a big beard. And when you ask him, he says he's a Pentecostal, uh, Pentecostal minister. So he is a um, sign of contradiction. <laughs> uh, but he has done many, many good things. He has written a number of excellent books. He has a community that's ecumenical. He uh, invites... Uh, uh, Orthodox, Catholics, Coptics, and um, uh, Pentecostals, uh, free church people, and so on, uh, to meet one another. And in this environment, many, many uh, young Christians in Sweden have started to uh, open their hearts and, and longing for the deeper wells, longing for the wells of tradition, longing for uh, uh, what the Lord has done in the beginning, what has been deposited in the church through the Desert Fathers and the Apostolic Fathers, Church Fathers, and so on. So he, although he says he is a Pentecostal and will remain a Pentecostal, he has uh, helped to uh, foster uh, a much more open climate in Sweden. There's also the Lutheran, the, uh, this is uh, number eight, the Lutheran High Church Retreat Center, uh, a community called The Mountain. Uh, and it's been very influential of uh, fostering a positive attitude towards unity in Sweden. Uh, its founder, uh, uh, the Lutheran priest, uh, Per Mosses, he was received into the Catholic Church just a few months before he before his death, and the whole community seems to be moving towards closer and possibly full communion with the Catholic Church. So there are certain movements that are going on uh, in different ways like this. And you know, if you, um, well, if you're a human being, you know that we usually don't like movements. We don't, we, we like to sit still in the boat, uh, don't like to rock the boat, don't want to offend anybody. And uh, it seems like the Lord is slowly rocking the ship uh, uh, for, for many reasons in Sweden. Uh, and it means that people are starting to um, find out about one another and be surprised about one another. Uh, the ninth uh, point would be Word of Life, which is the uh, uh, church that I've been a pastor uh, for in th over 30 years. And in the last 15 years, we have taken many initiatives towards unity, trying to broaden the minds of charismatics as well as other free churches and whoever wants to listen. I've written a number of books on these subjects and uh, I hosted a number of conferences with Catholic speakers and other speakers, uh, open for uh, to, to help people to be open for more deeper unity. And uh, we have taught uh, about the need for visible unity in spirit and truth. We also initiated uh, a number of study tours to Rome for pastors and leaders. And it's amazing to see a Swede coming outside of Sweden. 
Uh, you know, Sweden is, I mean, we live way up in the north, and, and uh, Polar Circle crosses our country up in the north, and, and, and uh, we're not isolated. We're part of the European uh, fellowship, uh, but, uh, you know, we're a little slow maybe, and a little cool and calm collected, and coming out uh, like this, going to Italy, it affects us immediately, uh, just looking at the traffic, and, and it's amazing how many of uh, Swedish tourists go into Catholic churches when they are outside of Sweden. They wouldn't dare do it in Sweden, but in Spain, in Italy and France, they love it. Uh, so um, uh, this um, uh, uh, this tendency, I think that what the Lord is doing here is that he's actually, um, uh, because the breakdown of a more unified uh, society that we used to have, uh, monopoly on religion, monopoly of state, which I'll come back to that a little bit more, uh, the restlessness and the loneliness that people have. Here are new opportunities uh, if Christians will take it uh, and, and, and show some form of, of, of uh, basic unity that people are actually very, very interested. There's been going on uh, informal conversations between the Vatican and the charismatic non-denominational groups uh, uh, at the Pontifical Congregation for Promotion of Christian Unity, and uh, I have participated in that uh, a number of years. And uh, the uh, next point would be immigra immigrant churches. Now, there's been a decline in state church in attendance, church attendance. Uh, there's a, a decline in some of the free churches as well. Uh, there is a crisis, and I'll, 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 I'll explain that a little bit more. But in this crisis, there's been an influx of of immigrant churches, uh, because we have many immigrants come, either come to work in Sweden or come because they're refugees. And uh, these are basically the oriental churches. And uh, uh, many, even theologians now say that they might be the survival of Christianity in Sweden, because they are very bold, they come from an entirely different background, uh, they are not censored by either by theologians or by the state, and they address very uh, plainly, I would say sometimes very bluntly, the issues that sometimes other Christians trying to avoid. So they are a very healthy influence in, in Sweden as such. And worth mentioning at last is also the emphasis of unity that had always been a part of the charismatic movement, at least in its, in its more initial stages in Scandinavia. And it has fostered a, 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 a deep sense of that we are the body of Christ, even though we are broken, though we are uh, uh, dispersed, though we uh, uh, are not united, we still belong uh, in one sense to one another across the denominational lines. So all these things together, I think this was 12 points, uh, they have formed uh, some form of informal unity uh, that has developed and come to the surface. And a, and a much deeper sense of discovering one another and actually knowing that we belong to one another uh, than possibly ever, be the ever before in Sweden. Uh, and this is actually uh, quite unique in, in Europe as such. Uh, and this is the the positive side of the discovery of one another. There's also a negative side of it, and the negative side is uh, that there is an idea of plurality, that plurality is good and it should be maintained the way it is, and that any form of conversion uh, to the Catholic Church or from to some other should not be done, but we should just stay where we are and look at one another and smile. And uh, I mean, it's good for a starter, but it's absolutely not uh, what, what the Lord has intended, of course, when you read, read, when you read scripture. Uh, actually, sometimes, even in these circles that are open for unity, um, conversion is highly uh, discouraged, it's sensitive. And um, I believe that these, the development that I've described up to now, uh, it is the first step, it's a good step, but uh, there are more steps that needs to uh, be taken. If, uh, this is step one, and step two means that we need to analyze now, uh, actually, what is it that is lacking, uh, that hinders us from coming even closer and being a strong witness together to the world outside, according to John 17, 21, and other verses, particularly, of course, uh, in John 17, the, the high priest prayer uh, of Jesus Christ, where he prays that we should be one as the Father and the Son are one, so should we be one. Or John 11, uh, 32, uh, 52, I'm sorry, uh, where it says that Jesus Christ died uh, not only for uh, 
Israel, but for all the dispersed sheep. To, he died for them to be united and to be, um, uh, well, to be gathered and to be, these are the two words, to be gathered and to be united. To be gathered doesn't mean, it means that we hold people into the same room. That doesn't mean we're united. Uh, it just means we're in the same room together, uh, which is good. It's a good start, but it's not the end. We also be to united. And how will that come about? So I think there is a um, positive element, uh, not just in, in, in Scandinavia. I think this goes on all over the world, uh, of discovery, of respect, of drawing closer, of understanding the signs of the times, of understanding the graveness um, that is actually what is going on in the world world today. But where do we go from here? Uh, <coughs> uh, the growing secularization in society uh, is a great concern in Scandinavia for, for Christians. No church and no uh, denomination in Sweden is immune to this secularization. There's both an outward secularization, the pressure of the world, but there's also an inner secularization, uh, which is a accommodation to the world and starting to uh, 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 accept things that we were couldn't even think about a couple of years ago uh, to accept. From the outside, the breaking up of the historic bastions um, uh, as a national church and a more unified society, uh, a more patriarchal, uh, patriarchal view on society, on family and church and individual, has meant great uh, changes, both in structure and direction of all these entities in the modern society. Uh, especially as we long ago, of course, have moved away from agrarian society uh, in, uh, and through an industrial society and in communication society, which is clearly postmodern and has a post-Christian uh, touch. Uh, I'm not saying that it's post-Christianity because I don't believe it is, uh, but it, it has a touch of it, of course. Uh, it seems on the surface that people are leaving and not interested. That does not mean that the gospel or Christianity or Jesus Christ is outdated. It means that we are in a, in a change and we must understand what change it is and we must relate to it in a proper way. And we cannot just stick our heads into the sand and just, um, or just hold the fortress. In the 1980s, Sweden was more than ready to dismiss Christianity. Uh, altogether as a force, uh, not influential anymore in society. Uh, in politics, the social democrats, uh, I don't know we, what, whether it would probably be the liberal wing of your uh, democrats or something like that. Uh, I maybe that would be a little bit equal. In the policies of the so social democrats, which was the governing party, uh, and they're now back in power again, uh, in one way or another for more than 40 years in Sweden, influenced Sweden strongly, heavily. And um, they had a clear direction, uh, which they spelled out uh, publicly, of ideologically taming the churches and turning them into vehicles and uh, political instruments for their party politics and, for the, and with the hope of eventually dismissing the, uh, these churches all together. Um, it is the old socialist idea that religion sooner or later must die, that science will prove uh, how crazy religion is, that step by step uh, religion would just wane, it would just, uh, it'll die uh, if, you, if we just push it a little bit. Now, of course, that is not what has happened. Uh, but in the process, the communication of the gospel in this environment became more and more horizontal and politicized, less vertical and lacking the supernatural element in many churches. I, it looks like it was a remnant of the past and it was also largely privatized, uh, being seen as a private affair, something that you would not mention in the public square uh, or uh, you would not allow it to have any influence whatsoever on politics and culture. And one question that steadily uh, arises uh, is whether the free church movement, the revival movement as such, um, with a much more uh, pietistic emphasis, actually also gave away, gave away ground and made it easier and maybe even accelerated this secularization. Now, I don't want to... Um, uh, you know, put the blame or, or be negative, but uh, usually the blame for the secularization in Sweden uh, is laid on the theologically more liberal Lutheran state church with its obvious policy of accommodation of, uh, to state and society. But lately theologians uh, have questions whether or not the whole underlying parodying of evangelical Christianity and pietism or revival movements have actually 
as a backside paved the way for the lack of Christian influence in the public sphere in the, uh, through the emphasis of the privatization of the faith. This means that it's not just society telling Christians to be quiet, but it's also Christians telling other Christians not to engage anymore, but to develop a, a personalized faith period. Now, this is happening by putting the individual so much in the center on the expense of and with a disdain of a more collective approach of organized church uh, and of outward, outward visible structures and the fear that cultural Christianity takes away from the deep personal experience and commitment to Jesus Christ and therefore should be avoided and shunned. As a result of both outward and inward secularization, the Christian faith is not anymore an obvious part of the cultural landscape or the foundation for the legislative process and culture expression in Scandinavia. Do you follow me? Is it okay? Oh, good. <laughs> the new, so let's, let's dig in again, okay? <laughs> so, so the new and the modern multicultural society on the surface has a quite big degree of toleration, much more in Scandinavia than the old unified society that we experienced in the past. Multiculturalists allow a diversity of expression up to a point. And where's that point? Well, the point is that if you do, if the expression you have which is valid, is one of many expressions in society, but the expression you have, if you say that this is the norm, then you have passed a line. Which means that you're okay to do basically anything you say, just as long as you don't say that this is right or that is wrong. So taking out objectivity and, um, uh, and moving in with a relativistic and highly personal experience, uh, you, you can almost say and do anything and on the surface it looks like freedom but it is mainly a decor giving the image of plurality more than authentic than real authentic freedom uh, of, of diverse expression uh, giving that uh, an emphasis and is also directed strongly where it's supposed to lead this is a freedom that is directed and uh, where the borders of the tolerance are clearly spelled out and where one is supposed to be uh, to uh, obey those borders and never cross them. I mentioned earlier this uh, wonderful thing, the Jesus manifestation in Stockholm. Uh, it's a great and, and unprecedented uh, success, both in numbers and uh, in the way different churches uh, uh, participated and also in the spiritual intensity intensity it's an amazing thing to see downtown Stockholm on a sunny uh, May afternoon 10,000 people on their knees and watching and there you see a Lutheran priest in his uh, in his black coat and here you see the the Catholic Bishop and here you see a lot of people that uh, are waving you know placards with uh, Mary and Faustina that has never happened before in a say in an ecumenical or or, or, or a Protestant meeting and uh, and all these people praying together this is an amazing thing and spiritually it is very strong uh, and we are very very happy for it. So this, as I said, is statistically big numbers. Uh, by the media was first totally ignored, like it didn't happen at all. Uh, but step by step, uh, it caught the attention of the media and they had to say something about it. It also brought a lot of joy to Christians that only a few years ago would never have marched together in the same march or bowed down together on the pavement to pray together. It is quite unique and, and should be applauded for that. But when the lights are dimmed and the banners are removed, it seems that the function of decor uh, for an image of freedom that is basically saying that our society tolerates almost any form of expression as long as it is, as long as it is, is it not a norm or challenges any other norm. This is highly problematic as it does not give room in society uh, for any real influence. 
uh, for, the, uh, for the gospel, but mainly a good feeling at the moment for the participants. Uh, this may sound a bit pessimistic, but in reality it is not. It's a bit sobering, of course, but it is also a starting point. So, to be sure, in Scandinavia, as in the entire world, there is much need for ground to be taken back for the church and for the gospel, uh, and a society both to challenge and to invite, uh, and this can be done. Uh, but before that, or at the same time, alongside with engaging evangelization, there also needs to be a proper analysis of different ideological scenarios and paradigms that do prevail within the larger, at least Protestant Christian scene. Uh, otherwise, there will be an overwhelming danger of eventual pes pessimism, defeatism, or a naive spiritual daydreaming about a revival that we hope it will come and it seems to never co come, as we, and so forth. Uh, and so uh, I have some points here, three points, uh, that I think are prevalent today in modern Christian thought. Now, I would say it will be be more in both Catholic and Protestant, uh, but um, um, I, and, and I'm sure you will recognize it. Uh, this is taken from the uh, Protestant environment, but it applies to any Christian in group, I would say. The first point is what I call a, a revival scenario. Now, I need to explain the word revival. Uh, the revival is the expectation that God will supernaturally intervene in the course of history to change things for the better. It is the understanding that individuals, persons, can and will be saved and will come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the model for this paradigm uh, is, in the context I'm referring to, the different historic revivals that have occurred the last 150 years in Sweden, in Europe, and of course in the US as well. And at its best, this, uh, there is a s hunger here for God. There's a hunger that this will happen again, that many people will discover Jesus Christ. And there is a longing for this to happen. That's a good thing. But at its worst, it is a nostalgia, looking back at past glories and trying to model, sometimes in detail, after what happened many years ago. Or just mainly longing for it to recur again somehow, but we don't know why. So it can produce at its best a, a, a strong uh, longing uh, to engage uh, in, in um, uh, spreading the gospel. Uh, it can also be a frustrating or disappointing um, experience uh, when this really doesn't happen immediately. At its best, this paradigm, the revival paradigm, uh, enlivens the Christians to personal repentance, to more prayer, uh, to live daily in the Word of God, uh, to try to live a holy life as best as we can, and to reach out in evangelization to, uh, to our neighbors on a personal level. So it is a personalized faith being expressed. The risk is still there, though, uh, that in this thinking there is a nostalgic permanence of certain methods that will turn into markers for different religious groups uh, that rather confirm their own church identity in the particular group uh, than these methods being questioned or being put to good use as instruments to reach out and serve the surrounding world uh, in a fresh way. And this can result in lethargy, tiredness, as results don't easily show up. This can result in giving up and starting to drift towards the world, towards the, wor the values and the behavior of the world, while still doing lip service uh, to classical truths and routinely going to church, uh, but being quietly disappointed. So this revival paradigm is strong on living in the now, reaching out, but weak on patience, weak on longevity, and weak on long-term thinking. The whole idea of training future generations, the whole idea of imparting and transmitting the Christian life, the dogmas, the values, is really not emphasized in this paradigm uh, as the expectancy lays on God's supernatural invention uh, through revival and our emotional response to it. It's really, you know, uh, God will do it, uh, God will do it, he will fix this, he, he, he will intervene. Uh, and in one way we forget what it says when Jesus gave the command that you go out. He, gave, he laid it on us and we easily can put it back on him. 
I would say that this thinking severely hinders a steady growth and a, lo a long-term thinking in evangelization. And it has a tendency to foster frustration and disillusionment. The second paradigm is the catastrophe scenario. Uh, it means an overall negative expectation and outlook on the future. This is based on certain important Bible passages, and this can be found in both free church thinking, conservative high church thinking. Uh, it emanates from the eschatological sermons of Jesus Christ in the Gospels and the teachings of St. Paul about the end times. Emphasis on this paradigm is on apostasy. Apostasy becomes very important. It is also an emphasis on the horrible scenes in society in end times and not so much on the blessed hope. Now, if the biblical basis, and, and, the, and the biblical basis for sure is there. We've all read it, it's in the scriptures, there's no question about that. But if the biblical basis for this teaching is isolated and overemphasized or overly generalized uh, or being fused with a general attitude of negativism or cultural conservatism, it leads to ex exclus uh, <coughs> exclusivity or defeatism or right out fear. In this uh, scenario, there is also uh, activist stress about evangelization. Uh, time is short, the end is near, uh, and this many times results in the neglect of the present needs in society, as heaven for sure is more important. Life becomes hectic, alarmistic, activistic, and sometimes very narrow, and it becomes fearful or overly sheltered in a ghetto-like existence. Another side of this scenario is the overwhelming emphasis of the future, talking about the future, trying to discern the future on the expense of the past, denying the significance of the past and denying the value of tradition. The third paradigm uh, is the desire of being relevant. Now, this relevance paradigm, paradigm is very prevalent. Uh, in the circles that I'm referring to, uh, it is highly motivated by the need for evangelization and an updated form of communication with people in a modern society, which of course is very good. And in this uh, paradigm or scenario, modernity is not something frightening in this paradigm. Uh, evangelization is the prim primus motor, uh, the uh, overall motivating force for the whole Protestant evangelical community. And the spreading of the gospel has preeminence over church identity. And I'll come back to that. And preeminence of a church life as such. So in this relevance paradigm, there is a reaction against both the intensive and narrow understanding of revival and the intensity and the frustration or the activism uh, in the catastrophe paradigm. Uh, there is a definite tiredness within many uh, Protestant circles about these paradigms uh, as they prove to be so narrow, too narrow, and not really producing good fruit in the life of Christians, but sometimes a lot of frustration. This uh, par third paradigm, the uh, relevance paradigm uh, at its best, is a modern way of connecting and relating with modern people and trying to identify with them, speaking their language and solving their problems. And the church uh, has always been notorious for answering questions that nobody is really asking. So sometimes we need to ask, you know, what questions are you asking? I've never heard any secularized person said, I am very, uh, my questions uh, has to do with grace and works. Um, this is what I'm really concerned about. No, they're not. They, they can't spell the wor those uh, words. Uh, they're, they're, they're que their questions are entirely different. That does not mean that the gospel uh, is changed for that, but we need to, uh, of course, update it in, in, a, in a positive sense. But as it's worst, the relevance paradigm is a surrender to the secularization process. It is an accommodation or assimilation, which is the absolutely opposite ditch of the ghetto mentality that I mentioned in Paradigm 2. Uh, in this Paradigm here, uh, the Christian ceases more or less to have any real distinct mark. It's being involved in so many different activities and attitudes that after a while it has a tendency to pick up the, ideological, the ideologies and the ethics of contemporary society 
while trying to evangelize. Uh, this is being done while one continues to hold on to certain classical Christian central dogmas. Uh, it becomes almost a bipolar attitude where one divorces doctrine from morals, church life from ordinary life, private issues from professional issues, and in this worst case but very real scenario, let me give you just one example. A Pentecostal elder active in his local church can at the same time be a doctor performing abortions, which has happened. Entire local churches, while professing to be conservative and by belie believing in their faith and their stand, can still deny support to midwives who does not want to perform abortions, which also has happened. Church leaders engaged in evangelization uh, from a, a uh, conservative or traditional standpoint, uh, understanding of the gospel, uh, can say uh, that fighting abort, uh, abortion is not a priority question on their agenda uh, or uh, they don't want to have a negative approach to it because it will scare off people. So uh, the whole idea um, about relevance, one has to be very, very careful uh, and really dig down deep and understand what are we truly talking about. Because there is an overall tendency not to relate to the daily situation and the problems of the daily situation uh, with a biblical theological foundation. Uh, instead, it becomes overly pragmatic. Uh, it, it includes avoiding words with biblical categories. Expressions seems now um, uh, alien or foreign. Expression like sin, righteousness, holiness uh, is avoided because of the fear of scaring people away. Uh, or because we have been a part of the secularization process that really is trying to take these terms, not the terms, but the reality behind them, uh, away from us so that we are not truly saved. Uh, there is a preference of speaking of experiences. Uh, the language is overly em emotive and words like self-realization, slogans, because you're worth it and so on uh, is coming into uh, sermons and into everyday talk. So it's a pick up of what is being used in the society around us. In the relevance paradigm, entertainment is very important. Christian services, meetings, concerts, sometimes even mass, takes on a form of entertainment, and they're trendy, they're modern, uh, with the approach and with the attempt not to differ from society, both in appearance, and that's uh, in one way, okay, in an evangelistic event, but also in theological content. This is all done with a purpose, with a good purpose to reach the unreached. And even if the intention is good, uh, which is to reach out, often the result is very negative, uh, at least in the long run, uh, because in the short perspective, there is uh, much ado about figures and instant success. Uh, and, and you can um, dupe yourself, you can uh, fool yourself uh, with success with numbers, with figures, where you say everything is well. Well, look at figures, it looks good. A lot of people came to our uh, conference, a lot of people came to our events. Oh, this is, looks, we are reaching out. We need to ask ourselves, are we really reaching out? Uh, in a more problematic circumstance, the question is, are we reaching out to the world or is the world reach it, reaching in for us? Now, that doesn't mean that we are supposed to live in a spiritual ghetto. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to engage. Uh, it doesn't mean that at all, but it means that we must personalize in our own life the answer which we heard yesterday. The answer is not just a doctrine or a principle, it is a person, Jesus Christ, that we know. So from the, uh, uh, the first paradigm, the revival uh, paradigm, uh, with the emphasis on personalized Christianity of having a personal faith is something that every Christian should have, but it does not stop there. And it's interesting to note that all these three paradigms can exist parallel to each other in the same charismatic free church, uh, sometimes without people knowing that these are actually uh, inconsistent with one another. Some people are not aware uh, that they differ from one another, uh, and, and in real life they, all, they often overlap. Uh, by having a pragmatic attitude, uh, one often really doesn't care too much about uh, theological soul searching uh, as long as things seem to work. The need for self affirmation and progress is often stronger than the need of discerning. 
especially if everything seems to go rather well, or if the need to try to revive a particular movement or a church to its past glories again is the strongest motivating factor for the people involved and not to bring forth Jesus Christ to those that need him. But, in the, long, but the long term results uh, of not taking time to discern these things, where we are and what are the influences on us, uh, how come there is an increase, um, it, it, will, it will cause us to experience rather an increasing alienation in the church, a rootlessness of who we are, where we're going and a fragmentation. Uh, even though the evangelical world and the more modern charismatic movements, uh, and they're all our brothers and sisters, uh, seem on the surface to do rather well, there is still a deep underlying frustration. Because there is a short-sightedness. Uh, there is also a reluctance to really uh, deal uh, deeply with these underlying uh, problems. Problems that in the future will be absolutely detrimental and as it's going to be hard to stand against the tide of strong increased secular pressure if, you don't, if we do not know who we believe in and what we believe in. As we look towards the future, uh, what elements in these paradigms must be challenged for Christianity to survive and to thrive in the secular elements? I have three points on that. Uh, are you still with me? Amen. Okay, thank you. Uh, just want to be sure. These three paradigms that I mentioned, they've been developed in certain specific historic uh, environments, of course. Uh, and it goes back to the 1800s where these movements were born, uh, and it was a battle with uh, both non-Christian ideologies and older church systems. The reaction to and the questioning of the authority of scripture, of the authority of dogmas and doctrines, of church authorities and structures, and of ethics and morals, has produced a Christianity based on feeling and experience of consensus truth rather than objective truth. And this is uh, very serious and it has to be dealt with. It stresses modern, newly invented traditions in contrary to ancient, ancient tradition with a big T. The overriding tendency in these paradigms is to only look forward and to neglect and many times despise anything in the past. It's a culture of replacement. And three things in particular we need to deal with. And the first thing is super individualism. In this environment, there is a deep seated feeling that everything starts with me. Yes, life with Jesus is personal, but it is not individualistic. The center of the universe is not my ego. Amen. To have a narrow emphasis on the salvation of the individual person on the expense of everything else and without identifying with the corporate church, create self-centered Christians and a consumer mentality. The consuming of pleasure, consuming of power, consuming of comfort, consuming of security. Christianity is all through God-centered, not me-centered. And here's a good place to say amen. Now the big biblical expression of Jesus Christ is not really, that he is my Lord. He is, of course, but it doesn't say that. And he's not only that. Uh, the biblical expression is Jesus is Lord, uh, which uh, has a different uh, touch to it, which includes more than just me personally. Uh, Jesus is the Lord of the church and the universe, and when, when I accept that, he becomes, of course, my personal Lord as well. The second point if the first was super individualism, the second point is experience oriented. There is a good case, of course there is a good case, for arguing that the Christian life is an experience. It is an experience. The emphasis of the experience has often been used as a criticism of sterile rationalistic faith uh, of many theological institutions. Still, faith is not just an emotion. Uh, it is not just a drive for constantly new emotional peak experiences uh, that would satisfy my senses or myself. This will ultimately drive people into spiritual deserts to thrive only on emotional or seek and put emphasis on emotional experiences in the end becomes a form of spiritual hedonism. 
some form of, 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 of self-pleasure. The third point, the lack of understanding and the fear of and the disdain of authority. The secular process of democratization, the idea of uh, the independent local church, and the autonomy of an individual. These are three different spheres. So you have uh, the democratization, uh, democ uh, democratization in society, which is a very good thing. Uh, you have indiv independent local churches, uh, which uh, are very prevalent in the Protestant world. And there's a tendency towards this also in certain areas in the Catholic Church, more of independence. And the autonomy of the individual. They all emphasize one word, freedom. Freedom becomes very important. But a worldly twist on the word freedom makes it hard for people to submit to other people, especially authority and hierarchy. So in uh, some uh, Protestant circles, uh, charismatic circles, uh, it is the, basic, the bottom line is, I submit to God but to nobody else, which is very convenient because God you cannot see and people you can see. So... Uh, it makes it hard to submit to authority and to hierarchy. A lack of understanding of incarnation theology produces a low esteem for any form of institution and structures um, that will primarily be seen as threats, not as instruments of blessings. I think this goes not just in the Protestant world. I think you can uh, see this all across the line. The idea that if you have submitted to Jesus Christ, you really don't need anything more is quite prevalent in the Protestant world. And here you and I are the ultimate authority, and you alone are the interpreter uh, of uh, what God is doing in your own life. The individual himself becomes the ultimate judge on everything, and I cannot think of a worse scenario than that in the church. It's problematic. The fear of abuse of power is great and understandable. Uh, it is constantly used, although, uh, to minimize all form of outward structure of authority. The favorite thought is that leadership starts from below. Here is a mix-up between the actual term office, uh, which many free churches are suspicious to use, and the attitude of the holder of the office as a servant in the office serving everybody else. Position and attitude is not the same thing. In this thinking, there is a reaction against what one supposes to be an ancient and outdated worldview in the New Testament and the need for removing any form of patriarchal ideas while still claiming to be biblical. These tendencies that I have mentioned, they result in three things, and I think I will end with this. One thing is that one does not anymore have a deep identity in the church and really doesn't understand what the essence of the church is. The church is seen more as an obstacle for evangelism, as an obstacle for the, uh, for the, the personal Christian life and for the spiritual life as such, uh, than a resource to it. The sense of me and Jesus built on super-individualism prevails a lot. The deep feeling of koinonia disappears. Of course, we are social beings, so we will, one way or another, still organize our lives, and we will have fellowship, uh, we will feel somewhat connected, but this is not the same as the unique and deep affinity that is, presence, that is present in the fullness of the body of Christ, and uh, uh, that needs to be revealed, it needs to be explained, it needs to be affirmed in order to be fully lived out. We are not spiritual loners. Can you say amen to that? This lack creates a sense of rootlessness and self-centeredness. It creates people that jump from church to church, from conference to conference, from, from um, uh, one form of piety to another. Uh, it also gives the wrong view of Jesus Christ uh, as if he would be distant from his own body. One example of this is a title of a book that just came out from a Pentecostal journalist in Sweden a while ago. And the title is, Jesus is going forward, but the church stands still. And I can relate to, to uh, the problem he describes, but I do not relate to the ecclesiological, ecclesiological view that underscores a deepening rift between the personal believer on one hand, Jesus on the other hand, and the church on the third hand. And the church will always carry the blame. The church 
see, is seen like a foreign entity, a problematic one. If you have a talk on healing, people will be very happy. If you have a talk on the church, people look mostly sad. There's something in us that reacts, and I think that needs to be dealt with. The second identity is not to have a deep identity in objective truth, which we have heard about uh, yesterday, uh, and in dogma. Uh, it results in a shallow and very relativistic uh, view on doctrines. The emphasis on experience, fused with modern relativism uh, and with postmodern pessimism, results in a distancing from objectivity and the need for further clarity. Doctrinal teaching is seen more as dead letter uh, than a living word of the spirit. And it needs to be brought back. Uh, orthodoxy needs to be preached in the power of the spirit. The contemporary pop culture, with its mix of hunger for freedom, read freedom as autonomy, uh, and emotional experiences, neo-materialism, which is really middle class comfort in a hippie style environment, has penetrated modern worship has uh, penetrated church culture and outlook on the spiritual life in general, resulting in an aversion against going deeper in the faith. This is sometimes excused by the need for connecting, for relevance and for evangelism. And the third tendency is to not have a deep identity in salvation. This seems remarkable uh, because the context uh, which I've been using, which, uh, the, uh, uh, which is the um, revival movement, uh, the word salvation is used more there than in hardly any other Christian environment. The word salvation is a free church code word per excellence. The word salvation is overwhelmingly used in past tense and also in a narrow meaning. I have been saved. Uh, this is definitely necessary, but it sure is not enough. The Bible uses the word salvation in a much broader, both a collective sense, and in a context that is both past, present, and future, not just one tense. If this has been narrowed down and turned into a formula, uh, then a number of deficiencies occur that will ultimately hurt and not benefit the Christian life, the spiritual life. There is also a, a lack of understanding of the role of the church as an agent and an instrument of salvation uh, and salvation as a lifelong process. The whole idea of being formed and fostered by the church, in the church and for the church uh, is weak or sometimes non-existent. Without this forming process, actually aided by the magisterium and nourished by the sacraments, we will be isolated islands. We will be untamed and undisciplined loners. We will be unpruned wild bushes, not yielding the fullness of the fruit that Jesus uh, spoke to us about, promised us, and that we were supposed to give. So to summarize this, in all of this, there is a quiet desperation behind all the many activist attempts and initiatives in many Christian circles. The basic questions have not really been dealt with. The three underlying paradigms that I mentioned before is a leaven that spreads throughout the dough of modest, modern Christian thought uh, and life, uh, especially in the free church movement and, and, and the charismatic environment. The revival paradigm uh, does not just produce personal faith in Jesus Christ, uh, but can foster a super individualistic attitude. The catastrophe paradigm, or the strong eschatological outlook, uh, which properly understood is about having us staying spiritually awake and alert in difficult times, can produce a very narrow outlook on life, a disdain for the past, a fear for the future, and an exclusive elite with an overly activistic agenda. The relevance paradigm, which at its best is an understanding and a compassionate attitude uh, towards the world and the need to connect, to be able to communicate, can deteriorate into compromise and accommodation. This results in a fusion of Christian elements with materialistic, hedonistic pop culture. This eventually opens up for liberal theological ideas in morals and practices and eventually results in the breakdown of Orthodox Christianity. Because of lack of inward, inward strength and identity in the church, the fragmentation and the weakening of many forms of Western Protestant Christianity will continue and accelerate. Uh, 
So this is a wake-up call. Uh, what is lacking? Many sincere Protestant Christians in the free church and charismatic movements are really asking these questions. They are very sincere. There is a definite hunger for God. Uh, but as there are so many divisions uh, and fragmentations and the underlying paradigms are there, it is not easy to recognize this nor to deal with it. Yet, and it can be seen in Scandinavia, there is today a new longing all along the line, a longing for truth. There is especially, this is especially visible uh, among younger Christians. There is a longing to go deeper. There's a longing to be more authentic. There's a longing to find proper historic roots and uh, to understand real authority and to live in deeper community. There is a strong longing to be united with one another in a more visible way, even structural way. And I, believe, I do believe there are two tendencies. One is the need to go out into the world and share the gospel, to be missionaries, not just to live in a Christian ghetto. Uh, the other one is a movement towards the center, and it's coming from many, many different parts of the Christian world. It is towards Jesus, and when it goes towards Jesus, towards the cross, it goes towards Jesus and his church, because Jesus is not divided from his church. And here is the biggest asset for the Catholic Church, and also the biggest challenge for the Catholic Church, to meet and to listen, not to be triumphalist, but to be lovingly truthful, uh, in this and in this serving Protestant brothers and sisters, where they are, will open up for deeper unity. Then Jesus the shepherd, as he promised, uh, <coughs> can gather all the scattered sheep into one sheep fold, according to John 11, 32. It is necessary for the church to be one, to be able to overcome the many and hard confrontations and challenges that will come tomorrow, already has come. The above mentioned tendencies, as well as these initiatives, many informal, have resulted in dramatic changes in the spiritual landscape and had opened many hearts for the need of true and visible unity. This development seems to be a unique window of opportunity not to be missed by the Catholic Church. Amen. We have a couple minutes for questions. If I think we are, if I'm on time, I think we have a few more minutes. Is that right? Okay. Yes or no? Yes. So if you have any questions. Yes. Is there what? A geographical center for Christianity. Uh, well, um, <laughs> depends on what you mean. Do you mean where things really are happening or do you mean institutionalized? Where, where things are happening, yeah. Well, there, there are a number of places uh, and, and, uh, and these, I mentioned uh, uh, several of them. Uh, so I would say that three or four places in Sweden, uh, there are different things happening, but, but definitely happening. But, but I would not say that it's uh, bursting forth, but it's something that is blossoming step by step. Uh, mainly in the urban areas, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I, the question is uh, that I did not mention Islam, and I did not mention that because uh, this is more of uh, uh, of what is going on between Christians. Uh, Islam has an effect o on Europe, and I think uh, that the positive effect is that so many people are waking up, okay, what do I believe? Uh, Islam is there. Uh, there are two, I mean, there, there are two sides. There are people that just uh, rationalize it and say, no, nah, there's no problem, it'll go away. And that's the other side that people are so alarmed that they can't think straight. So I think the bottom line is that a Muslim is a person and we must, we must meet them as persons. And I do not believe that they are immune to the gospel. I do not believe that. So I think there's a time not to, uh, not to have fear and not to isolate ourselves, but to distinguish that, that, that there are 
key questions, key doctrines that, that divide Christianity and Islam. And the bottom line is, who is Jesus Christ? And so, of course, there is a, a difference, it's a big difference, culturally, but, spir uh, but spiritually especially. But I would, I would really, really encourage people to pray for Muslims and not to be afraid of Islam. Just take one of them. <laughs> yeah. I think that, yes, the, the, uh, the, the question about the freedom of the churches in, 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 in relation to the state, and especially as secularization comes, adoptions and, and same-sex marriages and also, uh, basically in a, in, a, in a Swedish pulpit you can say anything you want. Uh, the government cannot come in and say we're going to withdraw, you know, the, uh, if you say these things. Uh, but, of course, there's a, it's a form of self-censure censor also. Uh, but that goes more, comes more from an ideological, liberal, theological influence, I think, than directly from the state. Uh, but of course, uh, there is a sponsoring from the state, uh, and um, it goes different ways. You, you get, why a bidrag på engelska? What's that in English? Uh, I don't know that word. Uh, you get sponsored, you know, yeah, I mean, for certain things. And also you get your tax back, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so there, in one way, a high degree, but there is pressure. I mean, society as such, uh, not only through legislation, but just through pressure, uh, is trying to to um, uh, to change Christianity in its in its very root. I would say. Uh, yes, I, I, in England, it's getting problematic. In Sweden, it has not occurred yet. It's, it's, still, it's no problem. Yeah. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, I mean, the Catholic Church in Sweden is very much alive in in many ways. Yeah, it's a small church, and and maybe that's a good. The bishop says it's a good thing because uh, you know when you are a minority, and when you're provoking society around you, you you have to know what you believe, and you have to to uh, foster devotions and so on. So, it's one way. It's a good thing. In Southern Europe is more of a culture. Sweden is not. <laughs> yes. It's one diocese, one diocese, yeah, the whole of Sweden, <laughs> it's one diocese. Yes, there's a seminary, there's a seminary. Yeah, yes, yeah, so there are a number of Swedish, and, 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 and the more Swedish uh, converts, and there are more Swedish priests, so things are slowly uh, coming along. Yeah. Now, Homeschooling uh, is is not accepted in the law, but we have uh, uh, Christian schools, uh, free free school schools. So the Catholics have, and uh, some Protestants uh, uh, churches have free schools and call Christian free schools, but not homeschooling. No. Yes. I'm going to tell that tomorrow morning. What was the reaction when we came when we le when we came into the church? I said I'll, I'll save that until tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, pretty much the same, I would say. You know, pretty much the same. It's been a uh, there's some nuances, but mainly the same development. Very secularized uh, the state churches in all three nations. Uh, uh, the free churches are bigger in Sweden than the other nations. Uh, Secularization is maybe stronger even in Denmark than in Sweden, but, but basically the same. Yes? Yes. Say, saying to Bridget or Santa Begitta, as we say in Swedish, uh, she uh, 
I mean, we read about her in the history books. Uh, we uh, knew a little bit about her, but not much, and the general public does not know very much about her, uh, because the whole thing with saints, of course, uh, uh, was avoided after the Reformation. But there is a new interest. There's always been those that that are uh, uh, that have ha had the interest in, in Saint Bridget, and I would say it's, it's it's coming back. A lot of things are coming back, and this is very exciting, actually. To stop preaching this about that, so so this is quite fascinating. Yes. Okay, I think you need a break. Thank you so much. <laughs>